Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidelis. It's Think Tech. We have Rabbi Itchel Krasnichansky of Kabbalah of Hawaii he joins us today. It's kind of an early Shabbos on, on, on Thursday. And uh, we're going to discuss the high holidays today because they are the most important holidays on the Jewish calendar. Hi, Rabbi. Nice to see you. Jay, nice to be here again and nice to talk to you. It's always, always a pleasure. Yeah. So let's, let's refresh on the high holidays. We spoke a little about it last time. Uh, and I want to, you know, catch up with you because the thing about Jewish holidays is that, you know, you, you study the calendar of the Jewish holidays and say, my goodness, these holidays have been celebrated for thousands of years. Nobody forgot them. And you can go into any, any temple, any Jewish community, anywhere in the world, any race, any diverse group that considers itself Jewish, you walk in and they're doing the same thing that the Jews are doing everywhere else that day, that same day, that same hour. It's, it's really remarkable how many thousands of years go by and these holidays are still there, still happening. I'm sure you're right. thinking that. Right, because they actually convey a very, very uh, contemporary message, meaning the Judaism and the Torah are, are eternal. They go way, way, way back but they're also very relevant and fresh and, uh, and vital to our, to our total well-being, to our spiritual health and our just life in general. So it's like, it's like uh, air that we breathe. Yes, every day we breathe air. We never get tired of breathing air. If we don't breathe air, we're not going to be around. Judaism and the holidays specifically are are that to the Jewish people? They're they're our lifeline, and yeah, very important. It's so closely associated with family. I you know I take Haaretz, uh, which is the uh, I guess it's also in print, but it's an online newspaper. I get it every day, sometimes more than once a day. Um, tells you how things are doing in Israel, right? And uh, one of the things lately is, of course, COVID, because Israel has COVID like most places. Um, and, and the study of it seems to be this, that the Jews in Israel, a lot of religious Jews like you, um, you know, uh, have these family experiences. Um, it's the holidays like we're going to talk about today, but it's also, you know, family. It's being together. It's having meals and conversations together. It's, it's about studying and learning together. It's the, the, the important word is together. And so what happens in Israel, you know, forget about the, the minion for a minute that the group of minimal group of 10 um, and forget about, um, you know, the, the holidays and, and the prayer, the prayer congregational meetings. Let's talk about family, talk about gathering. Well, it seems like the Jewish culture, at least in the religious Jewish culture, um, people are together all the time and they need to be. It's as you said, it's, a, it's an identity thing. It's a really strong cultural thing. And the problem is that with COVID, you know, it, um, it's not so good to be together. You have to have distancing and this and that. And, and of course, that's one of the reasons why there are these cases in Israel. And the government wants to, you know, slow that down. So they stop, stop doing that, you guys. Um, but the, 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 imp the impetus is so strong in Israel that the families, you know, are going to gather anyway, no matter what. This is a real dilemma right now. Have you, have you heard any discussion of this? Well, it's true. And I, you know, I know uh, even from the Israelis that live here in Hawaii and we have a, a sizable amount. Yeah, you can't, you can't keep them apart. They're, you know, they're raised to be together, and especially on the Shabbos, the Sabbath and the holidays. So you just have to be um, careful as best as you can and, uh, and pray that they come out with a uh, vaccine very soon. Well, okay. Keep, 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 be patient. Hey. Also, got to be patient, because, <laughs> you know, from a scientific point of view, that's not entirely settled. Um, but let's let's talk about uh, a high holiday. Let's talk about, uh, you know, uh, Rosh Hashanah. I remember when I was a kid, uh, the, the temple was never really full on a given Saturday or on any other holiday, but on Rosh Hashanah, oh. They came from miles around and, and there wasn't a seat to be found. And, you know, if, if you, um, and, oh, it's because of the beginning of the new year, you had to pay your dues. You had to pay your dues to the temple. And so that's the way the temple 
got people to pay their dues. You want to come to Russia Center Services? They got to join up. <laughs> and, and, and people were like hanging from the chandeliers. Uh, at Rosh Hashanah, and yeah, um, they're true. spilling out into the street, right? <laughs> Amazing. That is true. That is true. Uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are called the high holy days. They're not just ordinary holidays, but they are, they, they not only launch the new year, the Jewish new year, which begins on Rosh Hashanah, but it's interesting, you know, in Hebrew, the word, uh, the translation of the word Rosh, Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. It doesn't mean the beginning of the year. For that, there's a different word. Tchilat Hashanah would mean the beginning of the year. We called Rosh Hashanah the head of the year, and it's explained. But just like the head contains within it the life force of the entire person, entire body, in the same way also, these holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, contain within them the, the most essential uh, the spiritual messages that we need for, for the year. So they are foundational, they represent and they celebrate foundational uh, messages in life. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, Rosh Hashanah, j just, just to walk through the technical you know, the, the holidays, just a series of the holidays uh, coming up. So it all begins with Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the new year, the Jewish new year, the head of the year. And then there's a period of 10 days, which is referred to the 10 days of repentance, which culminates on the 10th day of repentance, it culminates on Yom Kippur, which is referred to as the day of atonement. The, the most holiest day of the year, the day we all fast and pray. And what began on Rosh Hashanah culminates on Yom Kippur. See, because in the, in, in, in the non-Jewish world, the way you usher in a new year is by partying and having a fun and good time. Uh, in Judaism, yes, there's also that element. And that's why we have these festive meals on the holidays. However, Rosh Hashanah is also a very serious time. It's a somber time. It's referred to as a day of judgment. And therefore, it's a very reflective time. And on Rosh Hashanah, we, it's not only that God judges us, which is what Rosh Hashanah is, but it's also a time of self-appraisal. When we appraise ourselves, our lives, and our year gone by, and make the necessary resolutions. And we're, it's a very... Uh, introspective time and uh like i said it culminates on yom kippur which is referred to the day of the At day of atonement and the theme of rosh hashanah and yom kippur are they refer to the 10 days of repentance aseras he made shuva now repentance is um is an idea which is which is which is so vital it's a gift from god to be able not only to, to control the present and the future of our lives, but actually to retroactively uh, clean up your past. You actually have the ability to make things right, even though that they were wrong. And that is the, that is the very basic idea of repentance, that when a person is remorseful, of the sins and the mistakes that they've done, whether it's your, between your, you and God, your relationship with God, or between you and fellow, fellow man. So God gives us the opportunity to retroactively make things right. And this is a wonderful gift. It, it releases us from our past. We're not, we don't, we're not necessarily bogged down forever by the mistakes that we've done in our past. So Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, in that sense, are very, very foundational. Now, the word repentance, well, let me just go back. It says, in, in one, of the, one of the oft-repeated prayers that we say on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is, and I'll say it first in Hebrew, and then I'll translate it, is tshuva, tfila, utzdaka, ma'avirin esroya hagzeda. Repentance prayer and charity annul any decree 
right? That even if, God forbid, someone did something, we did something wrong, and therefore there may be a decree upon us, <coughs> excuse me, nevertheless, repentance and prayer and charity are able to turn things around, to annul the decree. Now, if you look at it a little closer, what I just translated from the Hebrew into English is actually a mistranslation. And it's a mistranslation because the concepts, these concepts, the concept of quote unquote repentance and the concept of prayer and the concept of charity are very different in Judaism than they are uh, in the non-Jewish world. So the word for re repentance in Hebrew is tshuva. The literal translation of tshuva means to return. There's another word for repentance, because repentance is like regret. So in Hebrew, the, the word is lihit charet, charata, that's, re, that's repentance. The difference between the two words are not just a play on words, but they actually convey diametrically opposing ideas. The idea of, repent, of repentance, of, of regret, is when a person realizes that they're on the, wrong, on the wrong path and they decide to turn a new leaf to, to, to become the person that you really desire to become and that you're not. Now that is sometimes is very, very difficult to become a new person, you know? When you're young, you can change your identity, you know, very quickly. But as you go through life, to become a, new, a different person, to turn a new leaf, it's, it's very difficult. The idea of, of the Jewish idea is called tshuva return, which basically is, conveys the idea that essentially we are all good and because we have a godly spark within us, the soul, the neshama, which is incorruptible. And it never gets tainted. By any, by, by, by any of the sins that we've done or any of the mistakes that we do. The problem is that sometimes we lose touch with who we truly are, our real self. The idea of tshuva is the idea of rediscovery, when we, re, when we return to the essence of who we are. So we don't have to become, we don't have to become something different, something other, which is difficult. This is a very, very... Uh, almost like natural self-rediscovery. So that's the idea of tshuva. And for, for that it's, reason... It made me wonder about, um, you know, whether this was, you know, the forgiveness, forgiveness here. Uh, right. So the first, the first question is, uh, where does the forgiveness come? Because you can't, you can't have forgiveness uh, unless you, um, you, you both repent and atone. You have to repent yeah. and atone. And you so have 10 days to figure out what you should repent for and what, what you should ultimately atone for. Um, and um, uh, so at the end of that time, assuming you atone, what is it? You're, you're forgiven or you forgive yourself or uh, the Jewish community forgives you or the government forgives you or you know, who's forgiving you? God's forgiving you? Who's so forgiving, forgiving you? forgiving no, you? Somebody so is forgiving you. Right, so basically the only real important player is God. God is the, uh, you know, is the ultimate uh, being and the ultimate uh, source of everything. So we seek atonement from God, forgiveness from God, but that's only, as it's explained, in the sins that you've made towards God. But the sins that you've done towards fellow man, when you've done wrong to a fellow person, you have to actually um, seek forgiveness from that person. Now, the Torah does say that if someone has wronged you and comes to you and seeks forgiveness, you should forgive that person. And if he seeks forgiveness once, twice, three times, and you still refuse to forgive him, now you're the bad guy. Because the Talmud says that, with, that it is within... So the, there are three identifying characteristics the Talmud says of the Jewish nation. One is that we are compassionate people. The other one is that we have shame. And the third thing is that we do acts of kindness. Compassionate is 
forgiveness is you know forgiveness comes from compassion when a person has done you wrong and there's no question that the person was out of line and, and hurt you deeply perhaps but if you have compassion you're able to see perhaps that you know you know as it says in the talmud you can't judge a person until you're in his shoes and in his place you never know what's going on within that person and his struggles and you know which which brought him to do this you know the, the dastardly act so if you recognize that you know that the person needs healing himself um so that is a source of compassion okay uh, and then um and then there is the idea of uh shame jewish people have shame it's not a it's not a popular commodity today but uh shame is very important because shame is like an inner compass shame is what keeps us uh you know keeps us on the straight and narrow and then the last thing is acts of uh, acts of um of kindness you know the, the torah encourages us to give and to share etc etc so going back to forgiveness forgiveness is, is not always easy sometimes it's actually very difficult is it ever actually, is it ever rejected in other words um you know in the in the proper practice of the religion can you say no i'm i'm not going to forgive so, so that so that's a whole different discussion maybe we should devote an entire show to that but the answer is the person should always forgive but for example if you ask any jew whether it's appropriate to forgive the nazis for what they have done to the jewish people the answer is absolutely not there is no forgiveness for something which is so thoroughly evil now the truth is it's not for us to forgive the victims have to forgive you know we are just job's brother we're not job you know we haven't lived through it so you know it's not for us to forgive but but that's a whole entirely different fascinating I, discussion. I, I really want to tell you about uh, 60 minutes as a had a little segment about artificial intelligence um this past weekend that it was actually something they played before and it was about this team in uh, los angeles that took uh that took video, uh, three-dimensional video of survivors uh, and asked them thousands of questions and then made holograms out of them. And then you could, and then they would die because they were all old. And then they would have people ask the questions of the hologram and the hologram would answer because it was all recorded all with artificial intelligence. And there was a fellow there who he had died and um, there, there were people asking him questions Leslie Stahl in 60 Minutes. And she said, do you, do you forgive uh, the Nazis for you know, killing your kid brother or kid sister and all that? And uh, he said, no, I, I, I don't forgive the Nazis. Uh, it's not, just as you say, Rabbi, he said, this is his hologram speaking. <laughs> he said, I can't forgive them. If you want me to forgive them, ask them. Ask them if they forgive you, then talk to me again. Because they're by not. The way, Jay, by the way, Jay, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, uh, you heard of Simon Wiesenthal, right? For sure, right? The Simon yeah. Wiesenthal Center. He was a survivor of the Holocaust that made it his life's mission to track down, hunt down the Nazis, those who, you know, who were still alive and to bring them to justice. So he wrote a book called Sunflower. I don't know if you ever saw it. Somebody gave it to me. It's a mind-blowing book, a very thin one. Basically, at, right after the war, right after the war, he was in Europe, in Germany, I think, he survived the war. And someone came to him and said, there's someone in the hospital who's dying, a German, and he would like to speak to a Jew before he dies, can you please go visit him? So he went and he, and he went into this hospital room and there, were, there on the bed was a Nazi trooper, SS person who was on the verge of dying. And he turned to 
Mr. Wiesenthal, and he said, listen, I'm dying. I have to face my maker. And I've been thinking long and hard. And I, uh, I want to ask forgiveness before I die for what I've done. What I've done. So Simon Wiesenthal was quiet. And he, then he thought, and he said, no, I will never forgive you and the Nazis for what you've done. And he, and he left the room. And then he wrote a letter to like 50 big, accomplished Jewish personalities. And he asked them, what would you have answered this Nazi? And they responded. Many of them responded. And he put it together in a book for them. Very, 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 very mind-blowing. Very fascinating. But that's and a they, different discussion. They didn't all agree, did they? Well, you know, hey, that's the Jewish way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, so I, I go through my, my period of 10 days. Okay. I, I look back at my life. Um, I, I make a distinction between um, where, I, where, I, where I did something wrong in God's eyes, but also where I did something wrong to someone else in that person's eyes. Um, and I make, I make a mental list. Is this what it is? I make a mental list. And then I go on a day of fasting, 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, I go in Yom Kippur. I spend, I spend the day in, in the synagogue. I pray. I talk to God all day. Um, and I go through my list. And I say, look, I'm, I'm atoning God for these various things. And so, so my I want Monday, your forgiveness. I, am, am I right to say this? I want your forgiveness. Yes, yes. What happens ask for your forgiveness. Okay. So several things. But first, before we get to that, Maimonides, the, the, the great Jewish uh, codifier of Jewish law, he explains that there are two steps to the process of repentance. One is remorse for what you've done, to be genuinely remorseful for what you've done. And the other one is to take upon yourself the resolution that you will not do it again. That even if the temptation or the opportunity presented itself again, you will not do that again. And that, my mind is going on to say that, it, that if you don't have both elements, that's not complete uh, in, in the, uh, uh, repentance. For example, if someone says, you know, I realize that I have to change courses, that what I, I'm, on, I'm on the wrong road, I've, I, I'm, I've done bad stuff. But to be honest with you, I cannot say I'm re I regret that I went through those experiences. So yes, I'm making the resolution to be different, but I have no remorse for what I've done. So my mom really says that that's not a valid repentance. Because, as the commentators explain, without true remorse, if you don't fully, re if you don't really, if you're not really remorseful for the mistakes and the sins you've done, so that means you haven't rejected it and you haven't uh, exercised that from your from your being. Conversely, if someone says, "I, I feel terrible for what I've done," but if, the temp if I had the same temptation today, I cannot say for sure I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't succumb to it again. That also is not true repentance. Okay, now, so in, in getting back to what you said about, about forgiveness, seeking atonement from God. So this is a very, very, very foundational part of the whole process and that is you know we jews we, we we kibitz and we joke about you know the jewish guilt the eternal jewish guilt right that our mothers uh, have uh, have uh, embedded in us but always feeling guilty about your mistakes and your sins is a very un-jewish idea according to judaism we believe that once we genuinely uh, are remorseful for what we've done and we've done repentance and shuva. So we believe that God wipes our slate clean, that we're not the same person anymore in a sense. And we don't revisit the mistakes of the past and the sins of the past. 
that in God's eyes, as well as in our, uh, how it should be in our eyes, that, 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 that action or that behavior is no longer you, no longer who you are. So once, so, so once we seek forgiveness from God, we're confident that God, if you're genuine in your, in your, in your request, that God does forgive us and he doesn't get tired about forgiving us. You know, a man, us uh, uh, um, uh, finite beings and, and imperfect beings, we can be forgiving. But if the same person comes, you know, makes the same mistake again and again and again, at some point, we know we're not so forgiving, right? We get tired. We get fatigued from forgiving. God doesn't get fatigued. I hate to use the analogy where it's like a computer. <laughs> You put in, you put in the remorse, you get the forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny that you know when you look at it from the point of view of the person atoning, you have to you have to be comfortable with your perception that yes, um, you you recognize the errors of your ways, and yes, you won't do it again. Um, and you you actually, I mean, in, in the reality of it, you stand in, you look at God. And then you look back at yourself. You have to be satisfied that he's satisfied or she. Um, and only then do you come out of this. Uh... It's neither. Neither a he or a she. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that point, God, God has, you believe, you have concluded that God has forgiven you. And you can go forward in the exactly. new year. Uh, unencumbered. You can, you, unencumbered. You can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, unencumbered by the past mistakes. And that's yeah. very, very important. So, Rabbi, I, I looked it up a little bit, uh, and what, what did I find here? I found that um, that uh, Rosh Hashanah is the it's the it's a it's a celebration of the new year, right? It's a birthday of the new year. It's a, right. the first day of of Rosh Hashanah is the first day of the new year, and and that is significant because yes. that is a celebration. Um, what else does it mean? I mean, certainly it's a lul. A lul is the first month of the year. Is that what it is? No, Elul is the month we're in now, the month mm -hmm. prior to Rosh Hashanah. It's the last month of the prior year, and it is the month of preparation uh, that we begin to spiritually prepare ourselves to uh, to enter into the new year in the best way possible. But you bring up a very very good point, and let me just say two things. So the Talmud says. I'm quoting now in translation is that how strange are the Jewish people that on the day of judgment, they, uh, they dress in their finest and they gather together with family and friends and celebrate. Now you, Jay, as an attorney who probably spent a lot of time in court before judges, you know, from your clients in the past that if you're, if you have a court date and you, and you have to go before the judge and the judge has to make a decision, you know, either your way or the other, the other way, it's very, very, very frightening, especially if it's a serious matter, especially if you're standing before the Supreme Court justice and the Supreme Judge of all being, you would think that the, that the appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, demeanor and the appropriate mindset would be a fear and awe, which that is part of the high holy days. But where's the celebration? How can you celebrate before you know the verdict? How can you come into court celebrating without even knowing how the judge is going to rule? That's a, that's a really good question, because in the reality, um, not only in court, but in the, in the court, the religious court, the court of, of, of God, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. He may, or, or God, just to, not to say whether it's a he yeah. or a she, um, God may actually God is both not agree she. with you. He may not feel that you are being appropriately contrite. He may not feel that you full, fully recognize the error of your ways. And you may lose the case. You don't know. You don't know. And well, let me, same, so let me tell you, so let me tell you, so, um, you know, one of the famous prayers of the high holy days, and we sing it also is the Avinu Malkenu prayer. Sure, I remember. Our, our father, our king. Mm. So we have a dual relationship with this supreme judge. 
He is our king. He rules over our lives, but he's also our father. And as a father, who, uh, as a compassionate father who loves his children, we're confident that God will judge us favorably and he will, uh, and he will uh, work with our imperfections and recognize our imperfections as long as we genuinely really, really want to be good and want to be the best that we can. So yes, uh, that's where we get our confidence from. That's why we celebrate because more than the fact that he's our king, he's our father. And that relationship is, 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 uh, is the, most, the most underlying dynamic between us and God. And that yeah, answers a question that, that you asked me last time. Yeah. That why in the order of the holidays is Rosh Hashanah before Yom Kippur, when if if Rosh Hashanah is the day we reestablish our relationship with God, and Yom Kippur is the day of atonement, so wouldn't it be more appropriate to first clean up your act, first atone for your sins, and then we can present ourselves before God, and uh, you know and uh, and and re re uh, reconnect with uh, God and uh, accept upon ourselves God as king and uh, our, to, re, to, re, um, to refresh our relationship with God. So the answer is that our relationship with God is not dependent on us being righteous and perfect. We don't have to go through a Yom Kippur before we stand before God and refresh our relationship with him because our relationship with God is so deep that no sin can interfere and, and, and weaken this bond that we have with God because sin doesn't touch who, the essence of who we are. As we, as we said earlier, yeah. tshuva means to return, to return to who we truly are. Yeah, I think I, I think I got a I got a revelation on that, a, a little mini revelation. Yeah. And that is you, you rejoice on it because you haven't been thinking about it. And this holiday makes you think about it. And when you do think about it, you realize that although you may have trepidation, that your judge may, may not judge you kindly, you realize that no, in the end, you're, he's the most, or God is the most um, fatherly figure you could have. Uh, and he, God will judge you kindly. And that's, that's, the, that's, that's the, the rejoicing. Okay. That's the discovery. And from there, it's, it makes it easier, that 10-day period and the atonement on Yom Kippur. Uh, we got to go now, Rabbi. Um, oh, wow. It's really wonderful to talk to you. And uh, we'll Jay, if I, if I, if, if I can uh, suggest, maybe we do one more, either before Yom Kippur or right after, so we can get to talk about, because there's a lot more to talk about. I mean, we I can get that. into deeper and deeper. But thank yes. you. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Take care. Be well. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.